Uh, so thank you. And I'd like to say just kind of one word that it's really nice, especially to be in, in this place, in this university, uh, which combines something that I think is interesting. So on one hand, I mean, it's the open university. So it's open in the sense that you know, everybody can study here from high school kids to people who are retired, um, from taking you know, a full uh, degree to taking just a few courses. And on the other hand, they have something very, they're very serious and structured. So you know, when, when they open a course, they, you know, they plan things very well ahead. And I think the students, we see students who come from the open university, and usually they tend to be uh, very good. So I think it's, it's, I think it's a really, a really nice combination, this place. Uh, so the title of this talk, as you've seen, kind of the, it's a fast, cheap, but in control. And the, and the subtitle is Sublinear Time Algorithms for Approximate Computation. And actually, um, the, the name here, this long, the fast, cheap, but in control, uh, comes kind of as a take on a name of a film that is called Fast, Cheap, but and out of control. Uh, it's a documentary film by Earl Morris. It, it doesn't, so this is just an image from the film. It doesn't really have anything to do with the talk, but uh, I'd like, I kind of, I'd, I'd like the, uh, I like the title, so I decided to just uh, take it and, and make a take on it. Okay, so what is this talk really about? So first, kind of the, the starting point is when we talk about efficient algorithm, we say this term, uh, then usually we say that algorithm is efficient. We mean that it runs in polynomial time. Oops, uh, in the size of the input n. Uh, so, you know, naturally we seek as small an exponent on the uh, polynomial as possible. So, you know, order n squared is, is good, uh, n to the 3 halves uh, log to the third n is better, and, you know, linear time is just, you know, is, is fantastic, it's really great. Uh, but what if the n itself is, is huge? So that even linear time, which sounds excellent, uh, is prohibitive. Uh, are there tasks that we can s perform super efficiently, I will say, uh, in sublinear time? And so supposedly, just to really, just to read the entire input, it you know, requires linear time. So how can we do something better? But what if we don't read the entire, uh, the entire input, but rather we sample from it, which is something you know, we, do, we do quite a bit. So uh, when I talk about sublinear algorithms, I think we have some objects, kind of this blob, O, and we perform a computation that is approximately correct in, in, in some sense, uh, with high constant probability. And what we do is we can perform queries to the object. Okay, so now in order to define such a problem precisely, then we must specify what is the object, you know, what is this blue blob, uh, what kind of query access uh, are we allowed, what of course is the desired computation, what do we want, and what is the notion of approximation. So we need to specify all of this. So um, a few examples, you know, the object can be just an array uh, of numbers, and we want to, de to decide whether it is sorted. So here, kind of what is the approximate uh, computation? Maybe you want to tell whether it is you know, perfectly sorted or whether there are uh, many errors to, to it being, being sorted. And the queries are kind of natural. Maybe the distance will, is, is also natural. Uh, the object can be a function. And we would like to decide whether it is a linear function. Uh, and this corresponds also, we can uh, formulate the question as a coding theory. Is it, is it, is it as a word in a, uh, in a code, in the Hadamard code? Uh, the object can be an image, um, say, you know, pixels and, and by an image, and we would like to decide whether you know, it is a cat or if you want something a little more formal, whether it is a convex, uh, convex image. Uh, the object can be a set of points, and you would like to approximate the cost of clustering them, again, according to some particular clustering measure. Uh, and the object can be a graph. You know, we like graphs, and the object can be a graph, and we would like to approximate some graph parameter. So actually the focus here, I wanted to give several examples so you see that it's, you know, it's, it's wide, uh, but I'm going to focus here on, this, on these type of problems. Um, and I'll say kind of maybe a little differently from the other talks, I decided to go for a survey talk. So it means that kind of your attention span can be uh, relatively limited, so you can kind of doze off and then in return. But on the other hand, I will require some attention span at some, at some points. Okay, so what do I mean by, by graph parameters? Uh, graph parameters just a function that is defined on a graph. Uh, you can talk about di uh, undirected, direct. I'll talk about undirected, weighted, unweighted. Mostly I'll talk about unweighted, but maybe talk a little bit about, about weighted graphs. So for example, you know, a very, very basic graph parameter is the average degree of a graph. Um, it can be, we can talk about particular subgraphs, small subgraphs, and we want to count the number and the number of subgraphs, h, uh, in the graph. 
We can talk about the number of connected components, uh, the minimum size of a vertex cover, that's kind of more optimization problems, maximum size of a matching, a number of edges that should be added to make the graph K connected, um, minimum weight of a spanning tree, and oops, and more and more. So you know you can make up, uh, you can think about you know natural. There are many many natural natural uh, parameters, and so for all the parameters that I listed uh, in the previous slide. Uh, there are efficient polynomial time algorithms, either for computing exactly, in some cases they're really trivial, or pro uh, possibly approximately, as in the, the, si uh, the size of the minimum vertex cover. And for some of them, it's even linear time, so it's like you know, the best you, could, you can hope for. However, as we said before, now I'm kind of focusing in this, in this context, um, when the input is very large, it's a very large graph, uh, we want even more efficient. So that's the point, we want sublinear time um, algorithms. So as we said, the algorithms do not even read the entire graph. They are randomized. Uh, they provide some approximate answer for, the, uh, for, for what we want to compute. And we're, they're allowed uh, some failure probability. So they are required only to work with high success probability. I'll talk mainly about high, constant high. And in some cases, when we want more, we'll say, we'll say that we, how, how we can get more. OK. So we're talking about graphs. We're talking about sublinear algorithms. So we said the algorithm given query access. Before we had some you know, de general object. Here the object is a graph. But still, queries, there can be different types of queries. So what kind of queries maybe you consider? One natural type of query is to ask who is the ith neighbor of a vertex. So we think of the vertex has like these ports. And we can ask for a particular port, tell me who is on the other side. Uh, we can ask for degree queries. Uh, what is the degree of the, of the vertex? Uh, and maybe we want to ask a vertex pair queries, which means, is there an edge between U and V? So we specify uh, a pair of vertices, and we ask, is there an edge between U and V? And if there, is, there are weights on the edges, then in the case, who is the ith neighbor, we'll also ask for the weight on this edge. And when there's vertex pair, also we'll ask for, if there is an edge, what is the weight? Now here in most of the talk, um, but not all, all of it, I'll talk about these two, about neighbor queries and degree queries. These are a type of allowed queries and, and uh, that I'll mostly that I'll be interested in. OK, so we said what type of query access we have to the graph. And now what is the algorithm required? So after performing uh, a number of queries that is sublinear in the size of the graph, that's the important point, it should output some good approximation, we'll call it sigma prime, of sigma. So sigma of g is the parameter in question that we're interested in. Sigma prime is approximation. And we wanted high success probability, high, for now, high constant success probability. This is what's required. OK, so, but now, so now still we're kind, of, we're kind of continuing. What do we mean by a good approximation? We can have different notions of a good approximation. Uh, so kind of the, the best type of approximation is we're given a parameter epsilon, and we want to approximate the, the parameter in question uh, to within uh, one, or one plus or minus epsilon. I wrote it in, in, kind of an, in, in a way, in an asymmetric way. Of course, you can make it symmetric. Uh, but when we talk maybe about minimization problems, then it's, uh, it's natural to write it in this way. But you can, it's, it's just that, that's the way that it, right? So this is for, for any given epsilon, we want to, to get this. In some cases, we can't do it for any given epsilon. Uh, we, are, we have some fixed alpha, say 2 log n. And we, want, uh, we will say that'll be an alpha approximation. Uh, and another type of approximation is one in which, when I'll get to it, I'll remind you of it, that it allows both for a multiplicative factor and an additive term. And this makes sense. So this is here, we allowed alpha, but also some epsilon. And n will, will be the size of the range of the, of the parameter. So it makes sense when the parameter is relatively large. So for now, if this is kind of you need to think about it, put it aside. Uh, let's uh, stick to the first two. And when I get to the other one, I'll remind you of this, of this type of, uh, of this type of parameter. OK, so this is our setting. We have a graph. Uh, we're given access to it, and we want to uh, compute approximately some parameters. So I'm going to survey um, the results in, in three parts. Uh, the first one we'll talk about, and you see that the examples I gave, I will touch on not on all of them, but on some of them. I'll talk about the average degree and the number of subgraphs of particular types. I'll talk of size of a minimum vertex cover and a little bit about max and matching. And we'll see how much time I have. Um, maybe I'll give at least part, maybe some of it. We'll, we'll see on, uh, on minimum weight of a, of a spanning tree. And I'll try to give you, so there'll be, some of it will be just you know, telling you about results. And some I'll really try for each one to give you some ideas of how things are done. That's, uh, that's, my, uh, uh, that's my intention. 
OK, so we'll start with the average degree. Uh, I'll denote this by d sub average. And I'm going to assume here that the average degree is at least, at least, uh, at least 1. Uh, and this can be taken care of, but if it's much smaller, then th this comes at a cost. So let's just assume the average degree here is at least, uh, at least 1. OK, so the first observation, when we think about the degree, it's if we think about we have our vertices in the graph. So it's as if we have a function from the graph vertices to values between 0 and n minus 1. Uh, that's the degree range. And we want the average of a function. So, and we can query each vertex on its degree. So, but if it's a general function, if we want to estimate the average of some general function with a large range, and we want to do it to some you know, reasonable uh, approximation factor, it will require a linear number, number of queries. Because we, we may have kind of hidden, there can be many, uh, uh, many uh, uh, values that are very small, that there's this one very big, big value, or a few very big values. And uh, then we really won't be able to get any reasonable type of approximation with fewer than, than uh, linear number of queries. So this means, sorry, so this means that in order to get something sublinear, we want to exploit the fact that the degree, the, the, the values and degrees, it's not a general function. You can't have all kinds of functions and degrees. There are constraints because it's degrees of a graph. And indeed, this uh, uh, Uri Feige uh, was the first to exploit this type of, uh, he gave, it was part of actually a more general, uh, more general uh, uh, question that he asked. But for, de for, degree, for average degree, he got uh, roughly 2. So this kind of fits in the alpha approximation a little bit more, a 2 plus epsilon approximation of the average degree by performing a number of queries that indeed is sublinear, grows like the square root of n. So if you want to think about epsilon as a small constant, if you want to forget for, for now the dependence on epsilon, so it grew like a uh, square root of n, so, so you get something much better than, what the, than the, linear, uh, the linear dependence. And also, um, uh, going, we show that going below 2, if you want to go below 2 using degree queries, again, you kind of hit this linearity, linearity bound. And basically, you can, you can see this, get a feeling of this uh, uh, easily, because it's hard if you have a graph, there's a matching, and everybody has degree 1, the average degree is 1, compared to a graph where uh, all vertices by 1, they're connected to 1, they have degree 1, and this vertex is, is, has degree n minus 1. So, so, and here, so the average degree is almost 2. And distinguishing between these, again, if there's a random uh, naming of, of the vertices, is, uh, you cannot do it in, in, um, in less than a linear number. So, so kind of this says, OK, then you know, we, kind of, we have something nice and kind of close. You can't get anything better. But remember that when we ask the question, it's not only that the degrees are dependent on the fact that it's a graph, but we may allow, because it's a graph, maybe we can ask kind of not only degree queries, but also neighbor queries. We said those are natural queries that we may ask. So, uh, so we looked with, with the dead gold rock, we looked at the problem of both having, if we have degree queries and neighbor queries, then in this case, we can go below the factor 2. And indeed, we can get a 1 plus epsilon approximation. And the number of queries that we perform in terms of the dependence on n is roughly a little more than, than, than square root of n. And the dependence on, on 1 over epsilon is a little higher as a, a polynomial, polynomial uh, dependence. So before, I'm going to show you kind of almost kind of pretty much the idea, almost the proof of how, how, you can get, how you can get this. But before that, kind of a few comments. So one comment uh, is that actually when the degree, I said the degree is at least 1, but what if the, degrees, the average degree is relatively high? If the average degree is relatively high, the problem becomes easier. And we can replace the square root of n. Actually, it's the square root of the uh, n divided by the average degree. So it becomes, the problem becomes, um, becomes uh, easier. And in, uh, in the other direction, the really this result, uh, the results are tight. So you cannot go below the square root of n of the average degree. You can show that this is, that this is, uh, that this, uh, that this is tight. Okay, so I'm going to now kind of give you pretty much the idea of how, how this works. OK, so first ingredient, uh, we're going to consider partition of the graph vertices into buckets. And I'm going to say this I, bucket, there are, the, the, it's not necessary for the proof. I think it's easier to understand. But again, it's simpler, but simplicity again, is in the eyes of the beholder. But I, I find this a, an easier way, a way to, uh, to see it. Uh, so we partition the graph vertices into buckets. The number of buckets, and before I say about the number, what is a bucket? Uh, within each bucket, all vertices have roughly the same degree to within 
1 plus or minus beta, and beta is roughly epsilon. So we mean this 8, and so that things will fit, fit nicely. But roughly within each bucket, we just have roughly the same degree. What this means is that the number of buckets is roughly is, is, is the order of log n over epsilon. Again, think about log n, and let's put aside uh, epsilon. OK, so OK, we partition in our head. This is something we don't go and ask about, but we, we partition in our head. What does this, you know, what does this uh, uh, help us? And so now, at the first thing, we, we think about a kind of a thought process, and this will lead us to the algorithm. So suppose that for every i, we could estimate the size of the bucket. This is vi is a bucket. We could estimate the size of the bucket, again, to within the same 1 plus or minus beta, which is roughly 1 plus or minus epsilon. Then, you know, if we could have that, if somebody gave us that, then, you know, we would be pretty much done. Because if we take the size we sum over, this is the size, uh, this is uh, uh, the, an estimate of the size of the bucket. This is the degree roughly within each, uh, each, that every vertex has within the bucket. So if we sum over all the buckets, we divide by n, we roughly get the average degrees. So we have two sources of, of, of small air. One is that our bucket sizes are not precise. And the other thing is that not all vertex in the bucket have exactly the same degree, but roughly. So we would, we would get this. OK, so this is a nice thought experiment. But you know, how do we obtain this? You know, if somebody gave us, that's great. But how do we obtain this, uh, how do we obtain, uh, this estimate? So it's all very nice if we had an estimate of the size of each bucket, but how do we obtain such an estimate? So, you know, how do we obtain estimates of sizes? Well, we sample. So, you know, we would sample a number of uh, uh, vertices. We would check the degree, see in what bucket they fall in, and get an estimate. And, you know, we would, uh, we, without getting to the details, we could apply uh, multiplicative churn bound. But, well, there's a bit of a difficulty. Sampling is very nice, but if the bucket itself is very small, remember, we want something that, like square root of n, the number of samples. If the bucket itself is very small, much smaller than square root of n, then we have a problem. So this is just an illustration. You know, there's, this is a nice big bucket. This is a medium-sized bucket. Then there's this little bucket. Just to hit it, in order to even just see that it exists, we would need a number of, uh, a number of uh, uh, samples that grows like n over the size of the bucket. If the bucket is small, the sample is too large. So we have a bit of a difficulty. OK, if we have a bit of a difficulty, what do we do? Uh, so here, we do something very simple and nice. If, it's, you know, if it doesn't, if there are these small guys, they annoy us, they, they, we can't really hit them, we ignore them. So the second ingredient says, just ignore the small bi's. What do I mean? We'll take the sum here in this, in this expression here. I would like to take the sum only over large buckets. What is large buckets? Roughly square root of n. There's an epsilon f uh, fraction. There's a number of buckets. But ignore that roughly buckets that, that, do, that are sufficiently large that are of size at least, at least uh, square root of n. So ignore them. So what do I mean? Now what I want to, to look at, I want to look at, I'm looking only over large buckets. I'm looking at the estimate which I can get with something like square root of n uh, samples. Uh, and I'm throwing away all the, other, all, the other, all, all the other guys. And my claim is so definitely this is upper bounded by what we had before. So we won't overestimate. That's not a problem. But you know, we're throwing away things. Maybe we'll underestimate. My claim is we will. But we won't uh, over, uh, underestimate, sorry, but my, much more than a factor of two, two plus, uh, plus a, a little bit. So this is my claim. I'll put it up here again. And I want to convince you about this claim. So this is just for getting a factor of two. It's not, getting, it's not as, as precise and neat as what uh, we shows, but it, give, but it will give you the, the idea of why a factor of two, at least, is, is, uh, is possible. We can get that pretty easily. OK, so let's just remember kind of the corresponding sum of the degrees. What does that mean? It counts every edge twice. So it's two times the number of edges. So basically, we're kind of thinking about counting the number of edges. So now, again, an illustration. I have here, I put the large buckets. Here, I put the small buckets. And when I look at this expression here, I want to see kind of uh, when I count, I look at it as counting edges. What do I mean as counting edges? So I have, and again, this was. Small was roughly uh, smaller than square root of n, just to, to remember what, what it meant. So we have three types of edges. We have edges that are between vertices that both belong to large buckets. I don't care if it's the same large bucket, different large bucket, but both belong to large buckets. We have edges between a vertex in a large bucket and in a small bucket, and we have those in the small buckets. 
Now, what happens in this expression, kind of roughly, you can think about it, that each edge is counted. If it's this type of edge, it's counted from both of its endpoints, because they both belong to, so this is this. This, this type of edge, is, we can think of it as being counted twice, once from each, from each endpoint. These type of edges are counted only once, just because they're counted from the size of the large bucket. And these guys, those are not counted at all. So these, we're losing them because we don't, uh, we don't, we don't, you know, we, we don't look at all as, at the small buckets. So what does this cost us? So what does this cost us? So basically, what I kind of want to claim that it costs us only these, the number of edges here. You have to do a little calculation, but believe me, the number, the total number of edges here, because of the definition of small buckets, is relatively small. So even if we know we just we don't we don't we don't compute them at all, we lose a little bit. That's kind of where the epsilon comes. And what else do we lose? We lose the fact that some of the you know these guys we count twice as we should if we would have taken the sum over all buckets. And these guys we count tw once instead of twice, so we lose a factor of two. So basically, using this this expression, this, uh, 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 this expression, the sum over on the large buckets, we get something, a two plus epsilon approximation, and it costs us something of this, of this order, you know, the dependence on epsilon. The, the, the tilde here is for log n because of the number of buckets. This is for doing the, the estimate, and we, so we can get a factor two, a factor two um, approximation. Question? Yes. What's the end? Is it equivalent just to query square root of n? So here it really is. We're doing a kind of what? what okay, there is a question here that is, so you're saying if you took only we just do some, what the Uli's analysis was indeed just taking an average over a sample. The question is how do you how do you uh, how do you show that it really, it gives what you want? So there are two directions. One is showing that you don't overestimate too much, and and the other. So this is just a way of of doing it in by saying that those high kind of the by missing on. So it's it's kind of relatively easy to see that you don't overestimate uh, too much. But now, but here we're saying actually we we don't underestimate. So even if we throw away things, we don't underestimate too much. So definitely, if we would have taken them, but and there is there can be a direct analysis without the buckets. It's just the buckets is a way of kind of ha having hold somehow of the variance. So, but it's, it's really a just a, it's, it's a way of, of thought, but you can do it also, you can do it also directly. Okay. Um, so now comes the third ingredient. Uh, we want to get something we don't want this factor of two. So we think, you know, but where did this factor of two come from? We said it's necessary if we only do degree queries. This factor of two came from the fact that these types of edges, we counted them only once instead of twice. So what is the third ingredient? We're going to estimate the number of edges of this type, number of edges that are counted twice, and we're going to compensate for them. So here is the third ingredient. What do I mean by this? So again, this kind of illustration, large buckets, small buckets. And now what do I want to do? Let's look at some large bucket, right? We estimated its size. Excellent. We know that. But we want to know something a little more subtle about it. We know that the number of edges that touch it is its size times one of her better to the i, roughly. But what we want to also estimate, how many of them go in this direction. They, these are counted the number of times they should, how many are, go in this direction. So all we do is for each large bucket, we estimate the number of edges between the bucket and some of the small buckets. We can do that by, by taking sampling neighbors. So here we use the fact that we have not only degree queries, but also neighbor queries. So when we hit and another good thing that within a bucket, everybody has roughly the same degree. So we can easily sample a random edge that is incident to, to BI. So we sample neighbors randomly from, from BI. And here we get an estimate. So this is what we, we count here. If we call this EI is the number, an estimate of the number of edges from BI to small buckets, then we can, if we just add, so we had, this was uh, the two stars was, was our previous factor two estimate. So now what we do is we add to it, to our estimate here, we add, we compensate for what we did and what we, we counted only once instead of twice. We add to this, and in this manner we can get a one plus epsilon approximation, and the cost is roughly the same cost as we had, as we had before. Okay, so this was for 
the idea for the average for the average for the average degree, and I'll just say a few words about other things that are related to it without going into details. Um, so you can think, as I actually said this, the average degree, or it's like, it's like counting the number of edges. Edges are like the most basic type of graphs, just in, you know, two vertices with an edge between them. So we can, if we think of this as a special case of counting number of subgraphs for particular subgraphs. And so what about other subgraphs? And in, indeed, this, these type of questions have been studied for various types of subgraphs under names of like network motifs. And we looked at particular, uh, so uh, with Mira uh, Gonen and, and Yuval Shavit, we considered uh, kind of generalization of, of edges. We went to length two paths and more generally to K stars. So one of the reasons for looking at these are the fact that these are very, you know, they're natural basic types of structure. They're also related to moments of the degree. So we think about, we, look, we looked at the average degree. If we want to know something about the variance of the degrees or larger moments, then if we have, we, we know something about uh, estimates of the number of stars, we can translate that to actually more information about the degree distribution of the graph, not only the average, but higher, higher moments. So this is another reason uh, for being interested in these type of construction. And what did we show? Uh, so if we uh, denote by SK, so S for star, and K is the number, so this is K is, you know, this is in the middle, and these are the, the, K, the K things uh, around it. So we can give a 1 plus epsilon approximation um, with a query complexity, okay? I was wondering, this is the form of the query complexity. So you don't have, I don't want to get into exactly what it is. It looks kind of weird, but I'll say two things about it. Uh, so the two things about it, because it has a sum of something plus the minimum, and it depends on the number of stars, it looks a, a little weird, but two things about it. First, it is sublinear. It's always sublinear for every, uh, whether it's because, you know, we have the sum here, the minimum, but it is always sublinear. And the other thing is it's weird, but it's for real. What do I mean that it's for real? We show that this bound is tight. So we actually show that e each type of these expressions, uh, uh, there's a source to it. So we can, we can show that we really need, we need these to, uh, these, uh, this expression uh, to get something, to get something meaningful. And then just, you know, this, ex this part uh, is really just kind of a hidden part, and the others are a little more, a little more subtle. So as like I said, it's, uh, it's weird, but it's, uh, but it's uh, for real. And uh, this part I'll end with one more type of subgraph that uh, we looked at more recently is triangles. So triangles, something, there's something more, a little more complex about triangles, although they're, you know, they're just three vertices, but there's, there's a, a, in the structure of them, there's something a little more complex. And the, the question of triangles really has, has come up in the past uh, quite a lot, both exactly and approximately, uh, counting in various in social networks and in various type of contexts. Uh, but in all previous algorithms, some of them were randomized, but they read the entire graph. So they, they worked by reading the, the entire graph, and we are interested in doing some, something sublinear. Um, and so actually, in the, in the previous paper that talked about the stars, we looked a little bit. We didn't focus on triangles, but we said, you know, what about triangles? And then we showed basically that if you use only degree and neighbor queries, there is uh, no sublinear. There's a, a, a small kind of star to it, which I won't get into, but there is basically no sublinear algorithms for approximating the counting, uh, approximately counting the number of triangles. There was, I mean, for stars, we could do it. Now for triangles, there's something, something different. And uh, so then afterwards, we, we later asked the question, what if, remember, we had one more type of queries, which are vertex pair queries. So does it help? So intuitively, it sounds like it could help. You know, if you have like a vertex here, you have two neighbors. If you can ask a vertex pair neighbor, a, a query can give you information. And indeed, so we asked this question. And uh, now we is a, a different combination with Talia uh, Eden, Amit Levy, and Sishahadri. And here we also give a one plus epsilon approximation algorithm um, where we allow both degree, neighbor, and vertex pair. And here the expression is um, kind of, uh, is, is not as, uh, it looks, looks a, bit, uh, a bit nicer. It depends both on the number of edges and the number of triangles. And again, so it's a little hard to see exactly from the expression why it's the right expression. But here also, I'll just mention kind of that this is, uh, this is we have also matching lower bounds. So the complexity we get for triangles is also, uh, is, uh, is for real here, but we use all three types of, uh, of queries. Yes? Mm, sorry? Oh, T is the number of triangles. Okay, so this, I'll just mention something that is also comes up um, 
here and also in the average we, it seems the complexity depends on the thing that you want to approximate, which sounds like, well, you know, then how do you know how, to, how, how many samples? So you can do a type of search. So there it was just the search on, kind of, uh, on the number of uh, edges. Here there are two types of things you have to take into account, both this is maybe unknown, this may be unknown, but you can, you can, you can search for them and, 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 and get what you, and what you, what you want. Okay, so it, okay, so this is as I said before. The other one was always, always sublinear. There was always here. This is true that if 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 it uh, so you can switch. So the the if the number of triangles is very small, but then you can you can actually show that if it, the number of triangles below some level, you really have to look at a linear number of edges. I mean, you really have to look at the whole graph. You can hide them in a way that that you really can't. So it's it's inevitable. But I, but I agree. It's not it's not always a, it's not always sublinear. Okay. So I'll go now. So are the questions about the, the first part? Okay. So as I said, now if you kind of, um, I'll switch to uh, to uh, to the second problem, and the second problem is the minimum vertex cover problem. Again, look at kind of basic basic natural uh, natural parameters of graphs. So let me just remind you. Uh, so for a graph, a vertex cover is a subset such that every edge, at least one of its endpoints, is in this in this in this set. So this, for example, for this. Uh, for this, and we want, and a minimum is this uh, vertex cover of, of minimum size. So we know computing the size of minimum vertex cover is hard, but there is a very simple, and I remind you, if any of you have forgot that there's a really simple factor two approximation, can be found in linear time. Um, and uh, so now, but we ask ourselves again, linear time is great, but what about sublinear time? Can we get something, can something more, more efficient? So here again, we start with something. I think it's something we start with something, kind of a make belief. You know, assume that, and could we do something then? And afterwards, we think, you know, but can we actually get something for real? So before we said assume, we had an estimate of the size of each bucket. Here, actually, we're asking something kind of stronger, but we'll see how to deal with this. So it is an, uh, an imaginary oracle. Um, what do I mean by that? So the first basic idea is, suppose we had an oracle that for every vertex v, it would answer whether this vertex belongs to some fixed vertex cover. It has in its head, I don't, we don't know the oracle, you can, it's all known, it has in its head some fixed vertex cover. And I'm not asking the vertex cover be optimal, but it's at most a factor of alpha for some alpha, you know, maybe alpha equals two, from the, lar from, uh, from the uh, larger than the minimum vertex cover. So here we have our oracle, we give it some vertex, you know, it thinks a bit, and then it tells us, yes, it's in my cover, or no, it's not in my cover, and it's really, in the important thing, it's consistent. It will tell, it, it really answers according to that cover. And then you say, okay, if, if we have that, then we're pretty much, and all we want is just, we want to estimate the size of the vertex, the minimum vertex cover. If we have that, then we're, you know, again, sampling here will give us what we want. So let's actually just do this precisely. We would sample something like one over epsilon squared vertices. We would query the oracle. The oracle will tell us in the cover, not in the cover. And then if we, within the sample size of SVC is the number of vertices in the, in the sample that it answered positively, then just again here, by, this is by additive turnoff, we will get that the, the ratio between the number of vertices in the sample that belong to the vertex cover and the size of the sample is within the ratio to the uh, whole number of, of vertices, plus or minus epsilon over two is because I'll, I'll have some more error. So I want to keep for myself aside some error. Uh, so, but now we add, remember this vertex cover was not optimal one. It was within a uh, factor of alpha. Okay, so now we, what we get here is a combination of a multiplicative. So if we take, if we take now, uh, as our estimate, the the fraction in the sample, we add, we add uh, uh, the, the epsilon over, uh, over, over two here, and we multiply that. And this is just, you know, if you don't follow that, it's just for normalization to get between, uh, so, so we'll, we'll be the, the, the between uh, zero and n. Then we get uh, an S with high constant probability. Our estimate will be within alpha of the vertex cover plus epsilon. And this is, remember, this was our other type of, of estimate, which really is meaningful when the vertex cover is relatively large. Uh, 
uh, or stated slightly differently, uh, uh, you, can, you can take your epsilon to be sufficiently small, so you'll get a multiplicative estimate. But it's, it's simpler to think of it this way, multiplicative plus, uh, plus additive. OK, but this is all like in Hebrew we say, if my grandmother had wheels. So if we had an oracle, OK, that would be really easy. But we, so, and this was the expression we had, the uh, uh, alpha epsilon approximation we talked before. OK, but now comes the second idea. Um, that the second idea is we'll use d distributed algorithm to implement the oracle. What do, what do I mean here? So uh, here uh, we had, um, I hope you were all in the excellent talk of Karen in the morning. So then you, you know very well what are distributed algorithms. And also you have the background of the idea, of uh, some of the ideas that I'll talk about uh, here. So, but somehow in, in just one sentence, I'm going to, um, I mean, I mean distributed algorithms. I mean here in the message passing model. So we have a processor on each vertex. The, the uh, algorithm works in distributed algorithm works in rounds. In each round, each processor can send messages to its neighbors. And here, actually, I don't care even about the size of the messages. Uh, and in the end, in the end of the protocol, uh, we want each vertex to know: Am I in the cover or am I not in the cover? That's one. That's what I want. That's what I want in the end. Okay. So what does this? What does this help us? What does this help us? Is if we had a distributed algorithm that for the minimum vertex cover, approximate minimum vertex cover that works in k rounds of communication, what would our imagine now uh, we would, would have an oracle that would use this algorithm? What do I mean? When the oracle is called on a vertex V, what does it do? It goes to the graph and it says, OK, here is my vertex. It reads, now it has it is allowed queries. It is allowed to ask neighbor queries. It will go to the distance k neighborhood of the vertex V. And now it will just emulate. So it's not really a distributed algorithm. It's a very centralized algorithm. But you know, it, you know, it, it's allowed to do what it wants. So it will run in its head as if it, you know, the, there was a processor in every vertex, and they exchange and they exchange information. In the end, the decision of the ver of vertex v depends only on things that are a distance uh, k uh, from it. So it can emulate this algorithm, and then it will answer. You know, V is not in the vertex cover, or V is in the vertex cover. What about the query complexity? So the query complexity, we don't know anything better about the graph. Then it is the uh, maximum degree, they're called D, to the power of K. And, uh, but we get something, so for constant degree, we, and depending on, on what K is, we'll see in, in a minute, we can get something meaningful uh, by this kind of using, taking this thought process and making it real using a distributed algorithm. OK, so now what distributed algorithms do we have? So if we take uh, 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 work that I think also, maybe I know if it was this paper or maybe another paper that Karen mentioned, maybe men, uh, Karen mentioned the lower bound uh, result. So um, there is a, a well-known uh, distributed algorithm. Actually, it's more general. It's not only for vertex cover. It's generally for cover problems using linear programming. But if we want, we want to use it only for vertex cover, then, then we do that. What can we get? If we, we, we want here, remember this is the uh, uh, multiplicative factor. If we don't care so much that it will be bigger than 2, some larger constant bigger than 2, then we can get that our complexity uh, will be, if we take things into account, the, the number of rounds, our complexity will be d to the log d. So it's a, a, a quasi. A quasi polynomial. If we want a factor two here, then we'll need. Then uh, we'll need. We will. If we use this uh, this uh, this emulation, it will be exponential. Um, exponential indeed. So I'm going to give you. There have been quite a few improvements on this, which I'll list. But before doing that, I also have a few comments before I tell you about how things progressed. So first, one thing, if you don't like this maximum degree, it doesn't sound so great. Uh, 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 so if you, but we can replace the maximum degree, actually, by something like the average degree over epsilon. So this is one um, observation that, uh, that was made with uh, a paper with Michal Palnas. So it's, it's very, so even if the, the average degree is small, but the maximum is large, we still get something pretty good. Another thing is, we say, OK, but we want to go below 2. And remember, we're talking here about number of queries. I'm not worried about the computation at this point so much. I'm really, I really care about the number of queries. So what if I want to go below a factor of 2? Then uh, I, I, can't, I, mean, I can't do it. I mean, there's a big, a, a big leap for if we talk about constant degree here. I can, uh, there's a lower bound of square root of n uh, if we want to do that. And, if we, and for another small, slightly smaller constant, it's even uh, linear. So 
OK, so let's not try and go below 2. We, we, we will stick to, we'll stick to that. Let's, what about the other direction? What about going to, OK, a bigger constant? Can we do something better? So there is, I mean, there's still there's a gap here, as, as you can see. But there is a lower bound, even if you want to you allow the, con, the, the factor, the multiplicative factor, to be larger than 2. There is a lower bound that is the average, uh, the average degree. Okay, so this is kind of where we, where, where we, where we sit. This is kind of at this point what, what we have. Uh, we, we, if we, we can do something, uh, there's, a, the, the, there's a different lower bounds going below two. Let's put that aside. Uh, uh, going above, maybe we can get something better, but still not much better. And now what happened, uh, kind of what were the, the works, what, what was shown afterwards? There was a sequence of improvements for the factor two and the additive uh, epsilon. So first, uh, the, uh, with the Sharon Marco, we showed here, no, even if you, know, you don't want to focus exactly what is the dependence on D, so I'll give you kind of what is, what, what, you know, kind of what is the difference between, between the results. So here we were able to get something not exactly like this, but similar to this, um, but uh, with a factor of two, not a larger constant. And here it turns out, actually, this is one of the type of things Sharon went and had her kind of thought about it and had this great idea. And she was, it was actually, we're talking about a slightly different problem. But then, unfortunately, it, it turned out that she had independently, but later, quite a few years later, she came up with the, the, the same ideas of pretty much of, the, of, of Luby's uh, maximal independence set. Um, uh, and, but it gave us something, some, something slightly better. And then there was work of Nguyen and Onak, which, you know, at the first look, if you just look at the dependence on D, you say, hey, that's not better. This is, this, you know, here we get, uh, it's like 2 to the, to the log D squared. Here it's 2 to the D. It's not better. It is better in the dependence on epsilon. But what is interesting about it, and this, this is actually, I'll talk about this a little more, is they switch. They don't continuously. Here we had, you know, one distributed algorithm, and here there is another one. They, they had a, you know, they switched. They looked at the problem differently. And uh, they emulate, with also they emulate the classic greedy algorithm, and in a manner that I'll talk about a little bit before. And what happened is that this led to another uh, two papers. Uh, Yoshida, Yamamoto, and Ito were uh, able to show that uh, 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 better uh, kind of a, a variant of this algorithm in a very nice, sophisticated analysis could, you know, drop it from exponential in D to polynomial in D. And then uh, there was some uh, follow-up uh, work where we showed that actually you can get something almost like you can almost get the, the tight, the, the best result that you can. So what I'd like to do now is give you some idea of the, the NO algorithm, because you know, as is, it's not better, maybe, than what we were before. But it, it's a new, it was a new idea. And building on it, uh, we, we, we were able to get something that is, uh, that is pretty much uh, clo very close to, close to optimal. So let's remember, what does the, you know, the non-sublinear, just standard uh, algorithm look like? And again, it, it's, it's, I'm talking here about, um, OK, you'll see the relation to, to what, what Karen uh, showed in, in the morning. So we start with uh, a vertex cover C, which is empty. U are the uncovered edges. We need, want to cover all of them. And as long as the set of, un, of uh, uncovered edges is not empty, where there's still somebody who needs to be taken care of, what do we do? We arbitrarily select some edge that is yet uncovered. We take both of its endpoints into the cover, and we remove from the uncovered edges. All edges are now covered. I mean, we remove the edge, the all edges that are incident to the vertices. This is just the algorithm. Okay. Now I want to describe it a little differently because it will help me in what I want to show. So a, a slightly different description is the following. We, and again, it's a, you'll see that it's, a, it's similar to things that Karen talked about. So again, this initially is the same. And now pi is some arbitrary permutation of the edges. OK. And now I go over these edges one by one for each edge. If it is yet uncovered, I mean, if it's covered, I don't care. If it's yet uncovered, what do I do? I add both its endpoint to the cover, and I remove, I remove it and all the uh, edges that are covered. So, and actually, what is going in the background here? And again, if you, uh, so, oh, uh, here is my, uh, my uh, uh, yeah, here is my uh, uh, animation. So this is the ordering. So we take edge number one, and we take both its endpoints to the cover. We remove uh, the red or the removed edges. 
Now we want to go to edge number two, but it's already covered, so we don't need to do that. So we go to edge number three, we take it, both its endpoints, remove the uh, incident edges. We, uh, four is already covered, five is already covered, six, seven, we take it. So this is not such a great cover because we've taken all the vertices in the graph, but it's a factor two. That's, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's as good as, uh, you know, as we, uh, we can get for, for, this, uh, for this algorithm. So basically what is going, what is sitting behind here, actually we are, we are in the background, we have some maximum matching, which is a maximal independent set over the edges. It's a maximal matching. Initially it's empty. And each time we select, an, we select the edge and according to the order, we add it to the maximal matching. So this is what we're doing. And this is, this is what gives us actually the, the factor of two. So now if I fix some permutation pi, it, and then it defines a maximal matching that results from running the algorithm with, with pi. And what happens is that the size of the maximal matching is within a factor of two of the minimum vertex cover. So, uh, so now, what? So we, now, if we want to estimate the minimum vertex cover, then great. You know, we have here this bounding. You know, there's a factor of two here. We'll just estimate the maximal matching for for uh, for pi. And once again, as before, we'll sample these. You know, uh, one over epsilon squared edges uniformly. For each one, we'll check. That's the question. How we'll check? But we'll see in a minute. We'll check if it belongs to the maximal matching, and we'll do that by calling. Again, an oracle. Once again, we had an oracle, a maximal matching, a maximal matching uh, um, uh, oracle. So there are some issues here. How exactly do we sample edges uniformly? We need to normalize the number of edges. Let's put that aside. Believe me, it'll be OK. OK, so now a basic observation for, for the algorithm is the following. Suppose, that let's look at some edge E. Its endpoints are U of V. If it has some, so this is, this is my edge E, and there's an, an, another edge that touches it on one side. Let's call it E prime. And let's look at the ranking of these, these edges according to pi. So if, and suppose that this guy has smaller ranking, if this guy belongs to the maximal matching, so it belongs to this m pi of g, then certainly we know that E itself cannot belong, right? That's how the algorithm, that's how the, the, algorithm, the algorithm works. So how does that lead us to now? It won't say why the algorithm is correct, but it will lead us to, to, the, uh, to the, how, we, uh, how we run, uh, what is the idea of this oracle, the oracle for the maximal matching, then it will do the following. It gets an edge. It's supposed to say, is this edge in the maximal matching defined by pi, by the uh, particular permutation pi? So it will look at all the incident edges, all the, the edges that touch, uh, that touch, uh, that touch uh, E in an other endpoint. And now only if the edge has smaller rank, it will run recursively, it will call the, uh, the oracle on this edge. If it is true, then we're done. If, you know, if one of you discovers something is true, we're done. Only if only those with smaller rank, it doesn't have to look at those with larger rank, only if those with, larger, uh, with smaller rank return false, then I know that I'm in. Okay, so this is, this is basically, this is the idea. This is the same, the same algorithm. And the main claim of, um, of NO is that if we randomly select, so again, we have this random, this random permutation com comes up, again, came up in the dynamic algorithm. Here it comes up in a different way. If we randomly select the random permutation pi, then the expected query complexity of the oracle can be shown to be bounded by two to the d. So this requires some, some analysis. I won't, I won't, I won't say uh, uh, exactly how it is done. But then there's one more thing that might trouble you. You say, what does it mean knowing pi? If everything pi is something that is linear, it's, it's an ordering of all vertices. We want something sublinear. Something here doesn't quite, quite, what does it mean to select it randomly? But then again, the ideas that, that come up and are used also uh, quite a bit in distributed computing. We don't really need to select pi in advance. We can select it on the fly. So each edge that we consider, as long as we don't consider an edge, we don't care. Each edge that we consider, we assign it a random, uh, in some discretized uh, value, random value. And this induces an ordering over the edges that we are, that we are uh, interested in. So basically, the basic idea is we take uh, an, an algorithm that works um, in linear time, and now we, we, we emulate it locally from the point of view from, of, the, of the edges and see, and, see what, uh, and see what we get. 
And there's a way, and as I said, there, it is possible to go from exponential dependence on D to polynomial dependence. And there's also implications on approximate maximum matching, which I won't, which I won't get into. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll go now. I will skip the, the MST, the MST part, and uh, there's some nice, there's some nice ideas here, and um, and I'll go to the summary. So I talked about some linear, sublinear approximation algorithms. Again, we have a graph. We can query it. We want to approximate some parameters, and I talked about the average degree. In detail pretty much gave you uh, most of the idea. I, I talked and kind of gave you just the idea of the results of, for stars and triangles. Uh, we talked about the minimum uh, vertex cover and a little bit about the maximum, about the maximum matching. Maybe just I'll add in, in passing that this uh, direction from distributed to, uh, to, uh, approxim to sublinear approximation, there's also, there was also kind of going a bit back, taking ideas from the NO algorithm back to distributed uh, uh, with a guy Evan Multimedina. So we were able to get something that combines ideas together uh, for, uh, for approximate maximum matching and, and also in the weighted case. And I didn't get to this, so the weight. So that's something that, uh, that you'll have to read on your own uh, about the weight of the minimum version cover. So thanks.